where Dan Lord Dannell's wife sleeps with Maddie Groves, and Lord Dannell comes back and stands at the foot of the bed, says, what are you doing with my wife? Uh, here, here's, I've got this sword, and you've got this sword, let's fight. And he kills Maddie Grove, and then he takes his wife on his knees, says, who do you love best, Maddie Grove or me? She says, Maddie Grove, and he chops her head off and kicks it against the wall. <laughs> now, <coughs> and my mother reduced that to three little verses. Down came a lady, down came two. <laughs> You know? Hmm. Yeah, Maddie Grove. Yeah. Now the the old ballads are the, are, are just. Yes, I mean, they are murder yeah. ballads and, and. I love them. <laughs> I, you know, I grew up on chain gang songs and murder songs, sung by the murderers. Mm -hmm. No. Iron, Your mom brought Iron, them all home. Iron Head, you know. Songs. He, yeah, she brought them home. She played them. Why not? They're, they're like fairy tales. <coughs> yeah. Get you used to what the world's like. Oh, I think I'm normal. <laughs> I don't know. So, did did Pete frequently visit too? Did oh yeah, that's so special. Well, yeah. Pete was our special. Because he was visitor. big brother. Oh yeah. Uh, like my father, our father, he was tall and lanky, but he had that banjo, and he always had new songs, and he he. he he was so tolerant, and he was especially tolerant of us when we were teenagers, and you know, that was even better. Uh, and whenever he'd come, my mom would let us off school so that we could stay home and be with Pete. Mm -hmm. Cool. She did. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she got in trouble for it, but uh, he came with the songs, and I mean, we just, kids learn songs that so easily, they do. It's when we get tied to print. I think that does something to our memories. Um, I can't learn a song just from hearing it now. I need to write it down and then kind of hammer it in. But once it's there, it's there, you know. Yeah, so you're still doing the ones that you learned as, mm -hmm. as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I am. And the first, when did you start writing? Um... 24, I think, is the is what I've seen written. Probably. Um, well, I tried to... A late bloomer in this regard. I tried to imitate you and McCall to start with. And they're, they're very sloshy, those songs. I don't really... I use them for cannon fodder when I teach songwriting. Um, so you can say, right, what's wrong with this song? Could it, how could it be better? Uh, the first song that I wrote that I was really proud of was The Ballad of Spring Hill. Mm -hmm. And I'm even more proud of it because a lot of people think Ewan wrote it. <laughs> he actually well, they think he, it's traditional. He actually wrote one verse of that because I'd never been down a mine at mm -hmm. that time. I have been since, but yeah. uh, so I'm really proud of that one. Yeah. And I'm proud because there's a lot of people think it's a folk song. And you know, it was at Wordsworth who said he'd give anything to write a, a, a folk song that people thought was anonymous. Yeah. Do you, you still you really perform that? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, town of Spring would, Hill? Would, would you like to do that? If you, if you know it, join in. <laughs> Gosh. Let's cross your fingers. This is not your fingers. <laughs> I can't remember when I last sang this. In the town of Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, down in the dark of the Cumberland Mine, there's blood on the coal and the miners lie in the roads that never saw sun or sky. Roads that never saw sun or sky In the town of Spring Hill you don't sleep easy Often the earth will tremble and roll When the earth is restless, miners die Bone and blood is the price of coal Bone and blood is the price of coal In the town of Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, late in the year of 58, day still comes and the sun still shines, but 
But it's dark as the grave in the Cumberland mine Dark as the grave in the Cumberland mine Down at the coalface miners working Rattle of the belts and the cutter's blade Rumble of rock and the walls close round The living and the dead men two miles down Living and the dead men two miles down Twelve men lay two miles from the pit shaft Twelve men lay in the dark and sand Long hot days in a miner's tomb It was three feet high and a hundred long Three feet high and a hundred long I have been actually been in a coal seam that was two feet high and two hundred feet long and believe me I didn't know what it was before I went into it Three days passed and the lamps gave out Caleb rushed and he up and said there's no more water, nor light, nor bread So we'll live on songs and hope instead Live on songs and hope instead Listen for the shouts of the barefaced miners Listen through the rubble for a rescue team Six hundred feet of coal and slag Hope Imprisoned in a three-foot seam Hope imprisoned in a three-foot seam Eight days passed and some were rescued Leaving the dead to lie alone Through all their days they dug a grave Two miles of earth for a mark stone two miles of earth for a marking stone it is kind of like a folk song isn't it yeah. but if you sing enough yeah. oh. if you sing enough songs uh, folk songs the whole way that they're made kind of creeps in you know tonight I'm going to try and sing a ballad, a song that I made about an abortion, and I've made it like a traditional ballad because the tr traditional old ballads they are very, very different from from the songs. They've been honed and and tasted and 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 shaped in the mouths of generations of singers. So everything that's unnecessary has been taken away, and to try and create one of those right from the beginning, um, I did try that. That's for those of you who are going to be here there tonight. And that you wrote after watching the reports. Yeah, it was the first time that they had actually put on the television a, a rescue mission. I watched it in the north of France when I was trying to get back into England again. Um, it's, uh, and I was imprisoned on the north <laughs> coast of France. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Eating French tripe soup. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh -huh. I don't like the way the French cook it. I like the way the English cook it in, in milk and onions. Oh. But the French do it with vegetables and it's gray. Mm. Gray soup? Mm -hmm. Gray soup. Okay. You learned freight train from Libba Cotton. When uh -huh. was she here in your life, Elizabeth Cotton? Um, well, I thought it was me that she found in Woodward and Lothrop's, but I think it was my sister Penny. Oh, yeah. Because uh, when she came to work for us, I was, I don't think I was still wandering off. I uh, would have been about 11 or 12, and Penny would have been about 3. And, uh, and she worked she, at Woody's. Uh, I think she either worked there or she was, was there. I guess she would, was that the time when, when people of dark skin were not allowed in Woodward and Loth? I don't know. I didn't. And I've lived through that too. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she found Penny, and she was regal. I mean, she walked like a galleon, you know. Um, 
because my mother worked 12 hours a day for six days of the week, we had helpers in the house. And they were all from the South. And there was Mary Ann James, who had a college education and who didn't like, for some reason, I think she either taught or had a chance to teach at black college in the South. And she helped us with our homework and while she was ironing. Uh, she came from mon on Monday, Monday to Friday, and then Libba came on Saturday, and then Mamie came on Sunday. So um, we didn't know that Libba could play the guitar, uh, but we always had a guitar hanging in the kitchen. And it's either Mike or me went into the kitchen. Mike and I are still vying for the... Uh, even though he's gone, we're still <laughs> vying for the privilege of having seen Libba first playing the guitar. <laughs> But she was playing it the other way around. Yeah, you know, she was left-handed. Yeah, she was playing it this way, so that the this part, this of your hand, which is not as strong as the thumb for playing bass notes, that was playing the bass notes. And Mike and I both learned to play it that way, wow. left-handed. Mike continued to be able to, but I gave it up. <laughs> Ooh, so, that's uh, not easy. And she brought new songs. And a whole new way of playing, a whole new way of playing, because up till then we'd done the Carter family scratch. Right. Oh. And this yeah. is more, yeah, the, the um, Piedmont. Yeah, the other people probably know more about that than I do. Yeah. I really know so little about the instruments. Um, <laughs> I do. I know how to play them Everything my own way. Everything is relative, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. And you recorded with your your with your siblings. You recorded with your sisters. Mm hmm Yeah. It's, uh, well, we all knew the songs. Yeah. You know, and that was the time when it, when folkways would take. I mean, if they would take twelve obscure Canadian poets, they would take us three singing. You know, when we didn't really know what we were doing much. <laughs> but they had to get you into a studio. Unlike now, you yeah. know, we, yeah, we people did. record everywhere. Yeah, well, we also recorded at home uh, in, in Santa Barbara. Somebody just brought a recording machine around and recorded us there for the Three Sisters, the album, The Three Sisters. When was that? That would be the summer of 1955. 55, okay. Mm. Yeah. And, and all of you, it seems, at least started in college, but there seems to have been a pattern of, of getting yeah, bored and leaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, with me, the, with me, the money gave out. Oh, my mother died in '53. Mm -hmm. I went off to college in '50, uh, '53 in the in the autumn, and then the house was sold there, and my f poor father moved up t to a space about a third of that, with uh, his three daughters, five floors up. It wasn't a walk up, let's say that, but this little cranky old elevator. I mean, he really came down in the world. Yeah. He did. Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> it was great. And came up to, to Radcliffe where I was studying, but then the money gave out. Yeah. And I was sent over to live with my brother in Holland. Oh, that's why you went to Holland. I was wondering about that. Well, my that. father said, how would you like to go to Holland? He didn't say the money's run out. He said, how would you like to go to Holland? <laughs> uh, you can come back and finish your education another time. Mm -hmm. So I went to Holland. With, with Mike? No, With just by myself. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Me and a steamer trunk and two instruments. Yeah. You ever seen those old steamer trunks? You can practically live in them. They're wonderful. They open up. From, and they have drawers <laughs> and places you can hang your clothes. Yeah. And it was after that that you, that you went through, no, through went, Europe and then I went on the thumb for, um, for three months. One could do that then. Yeah. It's a long story. I'm writing a memoir, and my person who's writing a biography of me back there, she's the one to ask about what I did, because I'll forget. She's and taking she, notes. <laughs> she, knows, she knows all about it. It's a long story. A long story. I, I lived out of a knapsack for two or three years. Yeah. And, uh, Were you able to collect songs then? I wasn't interested in collecting really? songs. Okay. No, I had my book that, of songs that I had copied at Radcliffe. Mm -hmm. And um, the, every now and then you'd meet another singer, and, and they would they would ransack your knapsack, and you would ransack theirs. Um, you know, I learned, for instance, Tom Paley turned up at, at Radcliffe, and I learned two songs from him. Wham, like that. I don't know if he learned any from me at that time. <coughs> but, uh, and you only had back that time. I learned really quickly. I don't anymore. Um, you could sing a song to me two or three times, and I'd have it. Um, yeah. 
and I had a good memory for a tune. And that's very important because now, nowadays I think there's less attention to tunes, to melodies. And in pop music there's a bit of less attention to words as well. <laughs> um, and mind you, there's still rhythm <laughs> and there's still instruments which tend to be more powerful these days in a lot of the popular songs. Yeah. But, you know, we're all still here, folks, and, uh, aren't and we? We're still singing the songs, and I didn't have to beg you guys to sing on the repeated line of that Spring Hill song, so you're there, too. You know. And then you visited China and Moscow, and the State Department wasn't mm -hmm. pleased. Uh, well, that's a whole new bag of worms. <laughs> this, this was the 50s. It was 1957 in the summer. Well, mm -hmm. I'm a little distressed with that inside Lewin Davis thing because the Gate of Horn did not look like that back then. It did not look like that. It's a movie, not a bio. Yeah, okay, <laughs> the Gate of Horn was a little joint. Mm -hmm. you know? That was in the April of 57. And then in July of 57, went to Moscow to the youth festival there and made a fool of myself. Uh, and then I was invited to go to China along with all other 140 of us, but only 40 of us went. Mm -hmm. And that was a turning point. That was absolutely astounding. Because China at that point was, I think, only what, eight or nine years away from having M Mao Zedong having taken over. It was astounding, amazing. This country that had been owned by Western Europe for, or, for, or, the, or by the Japanese or by somebody else. And it was all of a sudden pulling itself up by its own bootstraps. It was very, very wonderful. Unrecognizable now. I don't want to go back now. I really don't. There was a wonderful spirit there. Mm -hmm. And then once, and, and I'm watching my watch here, once you got into the, the critics group in, in England with you and McCall, mm -hmm. I, as I read it, you kind of wanted to apply techniques of folk music and drama to the folk revival. Oh, well. and, and this raises questions. <laughs> How much time? Yeah, it? right. It's, right. it's five o'clock, Mary. <laughs> Read the biography. <laughs> ah. <laughs> it's, okay. it's more than that. Oh, Essentially yeah. Yeah. what it is, is that if you've been brought up with um, classical music, or with music hall, or with pop music, how do you sing a folk song? Yeah. Because the, the disciplines of singing a folk song, especially ones where words and tune are the most important, there are, we tried to work out a way of saying this is the way you can best serve these songs. Because it's very easy to totally ruin a folk song. I mean, it, you can turn it into something else. Mind mm -hmm. you, can turn Bach into something else too. People do boo ba doo ba doo doo doo. You can do that, but somehow songs that have been handed down through generations and centuries, you owe them something. You owe them something because they have something to tell you about the way people live because they were made by the people who were in the very lowest economic bracket. You know, not like. There were no paternal, you know, no patrons for folk music. There weren't. And they tell you things that, that the history books do not. And so how to serve these folk songs, that's why we formed the Critics Group. And that's how we got so many enemies in England. <laughs> 